Well, I, I'm, I'm, I just don't understand what's the one pager that. That was the one pager agreement that was put forth as an addendum mm -hmm. to the proposition because there was no agreement in writing. Well, but a lot of this happened in closed session. So I'm, I'm wondering how do we know what they knew and didn't know? I, it seems hard to know. Presented at city council. What was that? That was the, the one pager was what was presented at city council. Well, in the public meeting. In the public meeting when they voted because they hadn't voted. Before closed session vote. Well, I agree you can't vote in closed session. I think there's sort of a, well, it's an interesting question. I assumed that they had seen these documents in closed session or had access to these documents in closed session, but then that wasn't done. The, the documents weren't provided publicly until after the fact because they, well, basically because the mayor has been obviously not transparent about this whole thing. They've had a one, they had a one page which was an addendum, which was a letter that was that was emailed to Matt Gibb. And all it pointed out was the importance of having something like a library idea on behalf of the community because of the opportunity zone connection. In other words, you can't have an opportunity zone connection unless you're doing something on behalf of the community. Sure, sure. And recently, as of December of 2019, you can't have a real estate investment clearly Typically, the only thing that's in place. Right. Well, that's interesting. So I think I know the one page thing you're talking about, um, which is the letter. I think it's a, basically a letter from Dearborn Capital, from Brian Locke of Dearborn Capital, I think, to the mayor. And so you're saying that the council agreed to give the mayor the authority basically to sign whatever she wanted. Because right. they didn't see what she was going to sign. Right. And they, they weren't even interested. <laughs> Let's just get this done. Yeah. The transaction in, in, in a financial sense in, in, in their serving on the city council. And it's let's hurry and get this done. Uh, just because it's confusing and complex. And it doesn't mean anything anyways. I mean, the city isn't going to get valued uh, in terms of the community from this transaction in any fashion, why Kermit doesn't like it at all. And the truth is it should be the cornerstone for the development proposition. Well, that's, well, that's right. I mean, I, I mean, I, I mean, it, I'm, I'm laughing instead of crying because it's really sad and pathetic that city council just decided, Hey, we want this off our plate. We'll right. rubber stamp whatever the mayor wants to do. But I, but I think you're basically right about that. Sadly. I mean, I think that's right. So I also think that the, Thing that we're witnessing without any mention is that the deal's really weak. It's beyond even our 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 test of a weakness. Okay. Well, yeah, there are lots of other problems with it as well. Absolutely. If that were a valid offer, there would be no question about the deal's done. Right. <laughs> and it isn't, and it's because they're out there syndicating it right now. And that's and exactly right. They're going to get off over the the the, the goal line. Um, but I doubt that the goal line is going to be approachable on their behalf because they don't even have an understanding of opportunity zone funding. They think it's about money and real estate and it's not. Right, right. They clarified that um, and had to clarify that. That's what the rulings in December are all about. So I think they might be surprised at how little of um, a return they might find in syndicating. Yeah. So I don't, you know, other than that, I don't have a comment, but, but I think we should be thinking about that as, as a fashionable way of um, creating diversity in terms of approaches. Right. From a financial point of view, which I think is a real weakness for the mayor. Totally agree. And our community is that viable option. And, and I don't, I, I, for the life of me, can't understand why that wouldn't put some real focus and light on uh, elements that are more significant to a 21st century execution than a more traditional bureaucratic orchestration. Yep. 
Well, I think you're hundred percent right about all of this. And, um, you know, in terms of what we can do, I wonder, it seems to me that there's more we can do. I mean, certainly my email's out there and, you know, I've sent it to some people and they've circulated it, but it seems like there's more we can do to make the community aware of just what a rotten arrangement this whole thing is. Uh, yes. So we're, we're sending out a newsletter, which is kind of our review, something we do on a yearly basis at the end of the year. And we kind of held it to get through some of this and see, you know, what and how we might frame it um, in such a fashion. And we're going to include your letter in it, if you don't mind. Um, Absolutely. That'd be great. And it, it'll go out to some 700 people and of, of, of various uh, efforts uh, across the education and, and the city and, of course, the community, most importantly. Um, and, and we'll see what that gins up. Um, and if it gets any response, we'll see if we can't steer it towards the kind of things that we're discussing. And, and, and I put a couple of documents that, that I read more deeply last night um, on the website or on the website, on the mural, and they're highlighted in red. And one of them is about community platforms and city platforms and digital and, and, and all of that. And then the other one is about uh, share, right? and, and, and kids and, and, and the, the right that they have to a city that's not often recognized. So I'm using that as, as a vehicle because I think it's so, so important. I mean, we always talk about kids being the future. And of course, that's the point. But they have no voice in their city. And they need a voice in their right. city the future of the city. I mean, this is so simple yep. that you can get lost sometimes in, in its simplicity, but but really it's, I think it's it's, it's at the core of, of, of something meaningful taking place in terms of community engagement. So Monica's just, you know, rolling through here some of the things that were in this document, but um, these are these aren't extensive documents. I think one is 30 pages and one is 16 pages. So. Do you want me to show the chart, the graphic? Yeah, if you can show the graphic, that would be great. Is it possible for you to uh, email me those documents? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, that, that'd be great. We can do that. Um, and, and this is one of the you know top-down, bottom-up kinds of kinds of demonstrations within the context of. Um, the, the one about platform cities and platform cities are taking a real hit. I mean, they're, they're all around the world, uh, you know, being investigated and probably the most local one is the one in Toronto uh, that took place with Google and all the money in the world and the city of Toronto. And, and because of security, I mean, platform always gets the bad, the bad end of the stick when you start talking about technology and, and um, the ability to control people with technology and, 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 and then the use of their data and so forth and so on. So here was Google doing Toronto in Alphabet, all the money in the world doing and making this outrageous case for 12 acres on the city waterfront. And because of security, it died. It represented was so well um, uh, examined and, and, and Google, with all its money, just decided it wasn't worth the price that they were going to pay. Uh, so they're on to bigger and better things in other places. But but I think that's insightful. And I think that the worm is turned in terms of security. I mean, security can be really a bad thing if it's used badly. But it also can be something very good for a city if it's used correctly. And I think this, is an, a, this, this particular document is an example of it being used correctly. And because it's inclusive, because our community, um, for want of a model, has come to use their phones in such a dynamic social media, they just need to be connected to things that value their connection. And I think in this case, this is a dramatic case, but I think being in the you know, top tier of, of, of counties in the, in the country, um, we have talent and we have the expertise and, and such and so forth to, to make this happen. And we have a community that could be so well served by that taking place. Yeah. We have to examine it a bit uh, and see if there's anything there that, that makes sense. And, and Bob and, and, and um, Bill and, and, and Maddie and such have such connections and, and deep and depth of, of um, commitment to their, their self-styled executions over the years 
but I think that's 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 a place where opportunity can be tapped and in, in, in individuals and organizations and such can come together around a commonality of purpose that that that, that moves the needle right that all makes a lot of sense it makes a lot of sense well we're doing it I mean if it's not fun we're going home that's our yeah, motto that's <laughs> yeah I know, i'm sure you're not doing it for your health so I'm, i realize you're doing it because it makes sense yeah <laughs> that's about uh, us <laughs> yeah so so we we, we think that um now, what does that really look like as a, as a practical matter? I mean, when, when in terms of actual actionable steps? Well, I, I, think, I think these documents- I'm gonna will, go back to sharing. A, a really clear understanding. I mean, what we're talking about when, you know, we all hear these words, inclusion and diversity and equity, and, and yet we have very few examples as you just indicated. Oh. How does that work? Um, and, and it really is about the understanding that's necessary to make these kinds of things real. You know, one can hypothetically say anything as we've witnessed recently. Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> it's amazing, you know. Um, but it's another thing to offer something up that is tested and, and is part of an integral fabric in a community that is fed by the very thing that is necessary to have success, and that is by the individuals who make up the community. Right. That's what I think we have in the making here. Um, and and it, this doesn't have to be, you know, 10,000 people. This can be 100 people. Mm -hmm. This can be 50 people. That's uh, a good point. It, it, it isn't a widely um, proposition. It's a quality proposition. That's a really good point, and, and the, the, which makes it a little more manageable, I think. Um, and this, what I'm showing here is um, our Opportunity Zones prospectus that we've developed over time um, since we started engaging we'll, with the we'll Phoenix Center in, in, because in 2014. Because kind of define, and we'll send, you, we'll send you a copy of this as well. Yeah. Right. We're going to right. Share with people who yeah. can I'll give you an example. <laughs> so, so the mayor was at the um, the urban it's urban no no the uh, municipal Michigan Municipal Mich League Michigan Municipal League yep. on opportunity uh, which zones. has become the vice president so to speak and yeah so, <laughs> well well met she shows up with three slides and we were there in the room and we were the only ones in the room hell we were one of the few of a handful that even attended the thing I believe it yeah and that surprised her. And she gave her three slides. The, the, the prospectus that we have is 48 slides. Mm -hmm. there, something that's, Who knows that's got point. some depth to it. And, and by the way, right. we attracted $40 million 46. worth of offer, 40,600,000 from an Opportunity Zone investor. And, and right. yeah. in March of, of 2020. And we sat on that because you, you know, it's one thing to have a plan, and it's another thing to have enough smart people to carry off a plan. Right. Very, very true. So we sat. Can you put that. me there for a minute. Yeah. What? Yes. Yes, Bob. <clears throat> uh, I don't want to uh, <clears throat> rain on this. I think I think it's phenomenal, but it's hard for us uh, locally to look at that. Is more than a misnomer because we keep continuously going down rabbit holes that's not really bringing money in. It's making it look like money's coming in, but it's not money that's doing the locals any good whatsoever. As far as the um, decision that's being made, they're not being made in the residents' best interest. Yeah. It's a really important point, I think, because there is a sense of, well, hey, when, whenever we've seen uh, investment come into Pontiac, there's certainly a, a widespread sense, and it's, it's mostly true, 
that, well, that's not really benefiting us. We, well, the jobs aren't, aren't going to Pontiac residents. Uh, and in theory, you could build the tax base and provide better services, but that hasn't materialized, at least not uh, in recent years. So it, I, think it, I think people are wondering, well, wait a second, the, the mayor is constantly running around and touting projects and investment, but it's not helping me, it's not benefiting my life. And I think most mostly people are right about that. And and so I and I know you've thought a lot about this, Jim and Monica. So I'm sure you can speak to this. Well, it, you're absolutely right, and, and and that was the sense of opportunity zone funding. It wasn't because the opportunity zones represented a, a situation that was dire. We all are aware of that. It was the fact that these funds would be used as community developed propositions, not real estate investment for somebody who wants to get capital gains uh, reduction. And, and that's the basis of all opportunity zone funding is capital, capital gains reductions. Um, but they must be put to work on behalf of the community. That is the community decides which and how those funds will be used. And th there's the difference between what was just a um, uh, kind of a boondoggle capital gains uh, reserve for, for, for privileged people to something more dynamic in terms of the community. Um, and, and this is, you know, it was allowed to be real estate investment from around the first year or year and a half. And then it became clear that that wasn't working just as Bob's pointed out. So in December, they recalculated how those funds will be used. And, and I'm pretty sure that, that, that the weakened proposition that is represented by this real estate investment purely is not going to meet the, the credibility that's necessary to, to move those, those funds. But it, it really it begins with the inclusion of the community as the development proposition. That's why we're looking at OLSA as a, as, a, as, a, as a partner in this. They have a venture fund and they wanna do things with the venture fund, but, but they're again, not community oriented in a lot of cases, the real estate investments. And we've been having discussions with them around the opportunity zone funding model that their venture fund, uh, organization could utilize in the same fashion and in the same way that they're using opportunity zone funding as well. So, so there's a combination of focus there that goes to community. The community is the place in which, um, you know, that the, the investment has to begin and has to manifest and has to value. And we hear about it all the time. Talk about value, but very few people recognize what value is. They, they do the, the valuation in the return on their investment. And although that's, you know, an, an interesting concept, um, we have very few capitalism uh, elements in a opportunity zone funded investment. Right, right. That makes sense. Jim, <clears throat> Jim. Yes, sir. Uh, I just want to ask you, the meeting that you was in where this discussion took place, you said it was only you there. Uh, have any of these meetings that talk about finance and building prosperity for the city, have any of those meetings, anybody in those meetings ever asked, well, where are the key players, which are the residents or the community leaders? Have anybody ever asked that question in those meetings? We do, <laughs> we do, all, the we do all the time. We shared it. Um, but it, you know, the mayor, it, it was her gig and they didn't promote it one bit. Of course they didn't. You know, we, it. It, coming from us, it's one thing, but you think your city would be doing it. That's what's the shocking thing. And they did not, um, n none, there were no council members there. We ended up in a room with, um, a virtual room, a virtual room for their showcase. And it was dirt realty. It was a representative Elliot something from Dirt Realty. And we know, Tim, you you probably have to, to jump there too. So, um, but oh, yeah. it was Dirt Realty and um, the economic development director, Lynette, um, and Bird. Bird Gustafson, Bird Bird. Gustafson and the mayor and um, the new finance And we ended up director. talking the whole time. <laughs> yeah, the, new, the new finance director. Was, when the mayor left the room, as soon as she said, we were the only ones in the room. Well, and I... I yeah, sorry, go ahead, Robert. That's one of the things that concern me the most is that what y'all are talking about has never hit the community. Like 
the mayor was the only person uh, at the JDC. Now, this, every uh, organization that she infiltrates for our, on, supposed to be in our behalf. The communication is not getting to us no. that this is going on. So we're talking millions and millions of dollars over Oakland County as well as Pontiac that comes to Pontiac, but we never get the information until it's going away. Right. right. Well, it, and that's what I'm working on now with the CDC to try to investigate where we can pick up the slack at and get this information early rather than later. So with that, I'll sit back and relax it and listen. <laughs> Thank you. Based on that strategy, I think we can formulate our own orchestration. I mean, OSHA's interested because they're a valued community contributor organization. And they weren't aware when we were initially talking to them that their investment, their venture organization could be operating in the same way that Opportunity Zones are. But once they had thought about it, they understood it a little differently. So we had had the grant of the on behalf of the Phoenix Center, and very quickly that 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 failed to materialize, and we won't describe why, but but we know why. Um, and we had said to them that following that grant, whether it what became real or didn't, we would do it anyways. And they agreed that they would they would partner with us on doing that. And I think we have that in front of us right now. And we have ways in which we can use those dollars um, in, a, in, a, in a very productive fashion. So Bob, maybe we should get around the table here and discuss how you are going about your execution and what you're developing and see if we you know, can, can merge them into a dynamic that, that gets what you need on behalf of the community and gets ocean investment that is community driven. I'm, I'm gonna jump, but um, I, I do just wanna say that I, this is a really important topic. And I think there's a sense, uh, a, a short-sighted and wrong sense, I should, I should say, but there's a view on the, on the part of, of city officials or developers that somehow uh, incorporating or soliciting community feedback is going to create problems or resistance or opposition. And I actually think it's more the opposite, frankly, that, that as people feel included and they're proactively reached out to, yeah, they might have some suggestions or some proposed changes, but they're going to have much more buy-in into what happens and they're going to be overall more supportive. And I, I've personally seen that, and I think others in the community have too over, over time in Pontiac, that actually the right way to do it, if you're a developer or, or you're a city council person who supports the development, is, is communicate early and often with people, and they're much more likely to support the development. Absolutely. 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 And, and, and that's where most of the constructive elements over, let's say, 2018 to present are focused, just yep. exactly what you just described. Um, so we're in the right place at the right time, and we could be doing the right thing, but you can't do it without informed information. Right. Uh, without those kinds of things taking place, uh, you, you know, you, you're, you're throwing something at the wall and hoping it sticks. Makes you sense. Really need to have a great uh, understanding. And we know you got to go. Yeah, I'm sorry that I've got to run, but this was great as always. Let's uh, try to do this again in the near future, maybe next week sometime. I don't know what your schedule's like, but I do want to talk about next steps in terms of how we get the word out in the community and, and how we put some pressure on, on the mayor and city council to, if, if this is going to move forward, and it may not, as, as you noted, Jim, and as, as I've thought. But if it's going to move forward, it's really imperative that they make it less bad. <laughs> Tim, Tim, before you leave, uh, yeah, I think that we all need to look at some legal ramifications about this setup because uh, citizen participation is not inclusive of this. Right. And council has made it somewhat impossible for people to really exercise their right to speak before council. And I've gotten that through the clerk. Uh, but also, uh, 
those meetings that were held, the first, the meeting that was held on a Saturday, I was told before the meeting that it was a closed meeting. Mm -hmm. When they come back and said some decisions were made, I know for a fact that that's a violation of the Open Meetings Act. Yeah. So when I went to uh, and, and uh, listened to the council meeting, Kermit made it a point to say they they made some steps mm -hmm. to uh, make sure that it didn't violate the Open Meetings Act. But I hear y'all discussing this now, and there's still clearly violations of yeah. the Open Meetings Act that they didn't take if they allowed this to go through without this. The, uh, giving the information to the public on what's in those purchase documents or sales documents, as well as the agreement. And my people don't have, the neighborhood people do not have that uh, uh, agreement, nor have I personally seen the agreement between uh, the public and private organization that's supposed to be involved in this. I haven't seen any paperwork. That's why I praise you for your letter. And I would like to have signed off on that letter because they should not move forward with this. It leaves us as a city vulnerable to uh, uh, another shutdown. Well, well, that's a good point, Robert. And, well, there are a lot of good points there. Um, you know, the, so the, the Open Meetings Act is, is complicated, and I know I've got to run here, but it's only gotten yeah. more complicated with, with uh, the COVID and virtual meetings. And so there were some amendments made to the Open Meetings Act that were passed by the legislature this past fall. And basically, they allow the city mostly, and there, there are some issues, there are some things the city council is doing that, that do violate certainly some technicalities of it. Um, but broadly, the they Open Meetings Act, uh, during COVID at least, allows them to do what they're doing, which is to not allow direct public comment, but to say, if you email your comments in, we'll read them. And that is allowed, unfortunately. Um, the, now, one thing that you're raising that, that is a problem is they can't actually make a true decision, a binding decision in a closed meeting because they can't vote in a closed meeting. Right. So they can discuss things and they could, you know, get a, a sense of consensus through that, right? But they can't actually act or decide formally or legally except through voting. And that can only happen in an open meeting. And so, you know, I think they've mostly done that, but I guess I don't know. It's a fine line, and it's hard to know exactly what happens in the closed meetings because they're closed to the public, obviously. But um, you know, the, I think there'll be an opportunity too, Robert, or at least I, I think we should do this to to try to get um, co-signers onto the letter or some variation of the letter and do some public media around it. So I'm I'm very supportive of that and would welcome that. And I know Mr. Max, I was hoping he'd be on the call this morning because I know that he's talked about maybe doing you know, a press conference or something. Uh, I, I don't know if a press conference is the right format, but but something to try to get the word out. So I think that's it's really important for us to talk about that. And, and, and we'll work on that too. And we're happy to host conversations like this, but with a broader audience, yeah. just if, this kind of exchange. Robert, we'll send you the materials. All right, I'm gonna jump off. See you, everyone. <laughs> All right. Hey, Bob.